right so today we will uh, study the rsa crypto system so essentially we are we have more or less uh, discussed about the symmetric part of our uh, symmetric crypto systems of uh, which is in our syllabus so we will now start with asymmetric cryptography okay so with our number theoretic uh, assumption whatever we have learned we are more or less ready to understand the rsa cipher so today we will take up the rsa cipher's basic definition and also to understand that whether uh, how it operates essentially and then we will discuss about another interesting topic which is called quadratic residues okay so that will be also essential to understand something what is called test for primality okay so we will take up the one by one so first of all we know all this that what is the definition of a public key cryptography as opposed to a symmetric key crypto system so essentially we have got two keys here we have got the sender which uses the recipient's public key to encrypt and the receiver which uses his private key to decrypt okay so therefore uh, as opposed to the symmetric key crypto system where there was only one key shared by the sender and the receiver in this case there are two pieces of key okay one is called the public key and the other one is called the private key okay so so in order to encrypt in asymmetric key crypto systems what we use is the public key whereas to decrypt we use the private key okay so this or rather the security of this particular type of constructions is based upon something which is called one way functions okay so what are one way functions one way functions are those functions which are easy to compute but they are hard to invert okay but there is something which is called a trap door one way function because i mean uh, for the for the person who does not have certain trap door information or some secret information for him um, constructing or computing the inverse should be hard but to a legal user who has the trap door for for him computing the inverse should be an easy problem okay so therefore this serves as a trap door so an example which is commonly used is like this like if you take a large composite number which is made again as a product of two large prime numbers okay then it is believed that factorization of n is actually a very hard problem okay so therefore if i give you p and q from their computing n is easy but give i give you n from their finding out or ascertaining p and q is a difficult problem okay but if you are given one of the factors say p then computing the other factor is quite easy okay so that serves as something like a trap door right so therefore this is the basic idea behind one way functions and trap door one way functions okay. so uh, often public key crypto systems are also used for something which is called digital signatures okay so in case of digital signatures as you can understand the objective is like to something to do like the handwritten signature okay so therefore for example i have a handwritten signature and that is supposed to be like another person should not be able to copy that signature right so the idea is that in this case since you have the private key which is not supposed to be disclosed to every i mean i mean all people do not know the public key so therefore in this case when i will encrypt i will encrypt using the so therefore i will i will i will in order to do the signature i will use the private key okay but in order to verify whether that private key is really my private key you will use a public key so actually the private key and public key are suppose i mean like an inverse of each other okay but you can apply in any order like you can apply the private key first or the public key first but it depends upon your application so when you are doing encryption then actually you are using the public key to encrypt but when you are doing signatures then actually you are using private key to give a signature and the reason is quite easy right because of the application okay so this is a pictographic view that is when you are trying to encrypt then what you do is that you take the plain text and you have got a say suppose i want to send it to a person so therefore this is uh, so therefore suppose i want to encrypt so therefore i have to encrypt using public okay and in order to decrypt then i will use the private key so therefore alice has a corresponding private key but from this key ring which has got all the public keys like whether i want to talk to joy or mike or alice or uh, ted or anybody else so therefore what we can do is that from from whatever i mean whom i require to contact or communicate with i will choose the appropriate public key and then encrypt the corresponding plain text message okay and then the cipher text is being transmitted and alice 
because Alice knows only the private key. No, it is assumed that nobody else except from for Alice can actually decrypt the information. Okay, so therefore you see that there are certain things to be understood from here, like how Alice generates the public key and private key pair is actually very central to this algorithm. Right. Why does Alice require a public key? Okay, so therefore the idea is that uh, you, you know the definition of uh, symmetric key crypto systems, right? So in that case, what we have assumed is that both the uh, sender and the receiver shares a particular piece of information, right? But there, there is a problem that what that that is you have to do the key exchange because both of both of the I mean sender and the receiver has to establish the same piece of key, right? But that is not so easy now because you have to essentially have some costly channel for that, right? Through which you can settle out, settle out the key. So actually, public key encryption was actually, I mean, it was around 1976 or that, that time actually when these type of ciphers came into uh, came into existence. I mean, in the literature at least, because the the advantage is that here you can actually do without a key exchange. Okay, that's a very very fundamental advantage. Why? Now because here. The idea is like this: that is, suppose Alice generates a private key, which he does not, which he does not communicate to Bob, or uh, to anybody else. Okay, but what he or he or she publishes publishes is actually the public key. Okay, so from private key to compute the public key is quite easy, but from public key to compute the private key is a computationally difficult problem. Okay, so therefore th there lies the underlying security of this. Uh, but this this type of algorithms okay and that is the advantage also right so so therefore now you essentially have got this private key through which you can decrypt and it is assumed that nobody else but alice can decrypt it because alice only has the private key and from this public key information some i mean any attacker will try to who will try to obtain the private key will actually fa face a quite uphill task okay which should not be allowable in the today's computational uh, context okay so this is the base basic idea okay so where where in where public key encryption fits in so for authentication when you are doing a signature you are doing just the opposite right so therefore here when bob writes i mean generates so bob what he does is that he takes his private key and he generates a cipher text okay but this verification process is uh, can be done by corresponding public key okay so anybody can verify but sign only bob can sign it because bob only has the private key okay so that is the basic story or the basic application of uh, public key ciphers okay and uh, the, we will also study i mean for example the rsa algorithm which came into existence by three great people like you know rivest shamir and adelman so they invented this rsa algorithm and this rsa's underlying security is based upon a problem which is called factorization okay but there are actually an array of other uh, not large not so large also but still quite a few I mean, uh, uh, for example, you have got the Diffie-Hellman problem, okay, which we will study also. It's based upon something, and there is something called discrete logarithm problem. So there are certain computationally assumed to be computationally hard problems based upon which asymmetric cryptography are constructed. So when you make an asymmetric cryptographic algorithm, a new asymmetric cryptographic algorithm, the first thing is to find out such a hard problem. Okay. So, so uh, and also not, I mean, it is not so easy because you not only have to find one hard problem, which is supposedly a good one way function or a candidate for a one way function, but at the same time, you also need a trapdoor one way function because you need that a legal person should be able to retrieve the data, right? Should be able to decrypt the data. So, that makes it quite challenging, right? And at the same time, I mean, constructing one way functions, I know, I know that even after so much amount of work people have not been able to really prove that it's a one way function okay it's only like it's believed to be a one way function okay it's therefore it's called a candidate for a one way function but we do not really know that this is this is the a one way function okay so therefore let's go into the rsa algorithm now so therefore you have got this rsa crypto system okay so therefore uh, the so therefore here actually you take two prime numbers p and q which are actually significantly large numbers. Okay, so large means uh, suppose around 1,024 bits. Okay, so typically I'm just giving you some thumb rule uh, data actually. That's it. So therefore you take two, say around say 1,024 bit value. Okay, n, 
and which can be also decomposed into P and Q of similar kind of dimensions. Okay. So, here your P and Q are two prime numbers, if you multiply them you get N, okay. but there is a keying material which is actually made up of the public key part and also the private key part. Okay. So, here you have got N which is actually the public key information, everybody knows what is the value of N, N is published actually, but P and Q are secret information. Okay. So, suppose I want to encrypt some data, I have my own P and Q values. Okay. So, there is something which is called A, which is actually also the I mean part of the private key and there is a B, which is actually the public key. Okay. So, here you have got two materials like A and B, which if you multiply and if you take mod of phi n, then you get 1. Okay. So, therefore, A and B are the multiplicative inverses of each other in the field of what is the field but phi modu modulo modulo phi n but what is the field z n star okay so therefore you are doing a modulo phi n there right and uh, so therefore uh, for k so therefore for k equal to n p comma q comma a comma b okay there are two parts the values n and b comprise the public key whereas the other part that is the values p q and a forms the private key Okay, so, what is the encryption function? The encryption function looks fairly easy. You take x which you want to encrypt. right? So, I, as I told you that b is the public key. right? So, therefore, if you want to encrypt x, what you do is that you take x and raise it to the power of b and take a modulo n. Okay? And if you want to decrypt, then you take x to the power of b mod n, which is y. Okay? And then what you do is that you raise it to the power of a mod n. So, the belief is that, so therefore, what you have to now prove is that if you do d k y, you get back x, right. That is what you need to prove. So, the values n and b comprise the public key and the values p, q and a forms the private key, right. Is the definition clear? So, there are certain things to be kept in mind like a and b, if you multiply and then and take modulo phi n you get back 1, encryption function is x raised to the power of b, where b is a public key mod n and if you are decrypting, then you raise it to the power of a. So, a has to be the private key part and you do a mod n. So, actually you see that whether b is the public key or a is the public key does not really matter, if it holds because since multiplication is a commutative process. Okay? So, therefore, it really does not matter whether b is a private key or b is a public key. Okay? But the thing is that when you are encrypting, then you will use b as a public key but when you are generating digital signatures, then B will be a private key, right. So, it just depends upon the application, but mathematically anything can work, okay. So, we have to prove this result. <coughs> yeah. It comes. First of all, let us see the proof, then you will then we'll understand actually, okay. So, actually in the definition of the encryption function, it really does not matter, but it matters in case of A B equal to 1. So, what is phi n? No, but phi n uh, no, that is fine, but what is phi n computationally? It is equal to p minus 1 into q minus 1. So, it comes right in the definition phi n means p minus 1 into q minus 1. So, there p, p and q comes right. So, let us try to understand the proof. Okay? The proof can be actually divided into two parts. Okay? So, the first okay, first you see that a b equal to 1 or congruent to 1 mod phi n means that a b of the is of this type that 1 plus t of phi n, where t is some integer greater than equal to 1. right? So, therefore, if you take a mod of phi n, then you get back 1. So, suppose x belongs to z n star. So, therefore, x belongs to z n star means if I raise x to the power of a b, okay, then that means that is x to the power of 1 plus t phi n and this you can decompose into x into x to the power of phi n whole power t and you know by your previous result like last day what we saw x to the power of phi n mod n is equal to 1. Okay? So, using that result you get back x mod n. Okay? So, this follows from Euler's theorem, but if x does not belong to z n I mean rather it does not belong to z n star. So, whether basically it belongs to z n different z n star then the proof is slightly trickier. Okay? So, let us see this. So, this part is clear. 
this is quite straightforward, follows directly from the Euler's theorem. Okay. So, in this part, so if x does not belong to Zn star, that means that GCD of x and n is not equal to 1 because x and n are not co prime. Right? If x would have belonged to Zn star, then x would have been co prime to n. But if x does not belong to Zn star, it implies that x and n, if you take the greatest common divisor, it is not equal to 1. Right? Now, what is n? n is the product of two prime numbers p and q. So, if in that case, if you are, and remember that x is also less than n, right. So, that means what? That means that x has to be either a multiple of p or it has to be a multiple of q, right. So, in this case, let us assume that the GCD of x comma p will be, I mean GCD of x comma p can be either p or GCD of x comma q will be equal to q. So, because if x is a multiple of p, then the GCD of x comma p will be p, right. And if the GCD of x and I mean if x is a multiple of q, then GCD of x comma q will be equal to q. Okay. Note another thing that if the GCD of x comma p is equal to p, then the GCD of x comma q has to be equal to 1. Why? And because otherwise x will be a multiple of both p and q and therefore it will be more than n. But we know that x is by definition less than p q, right, because it belongs to z n, right. It is x belongs to z n different z n star. So, x belongs to z n, right. So, therefore, x, so therefore, G C D of x comma p will be equal to p, then it implies that G C D of x comma q is equal to 1. So, that means what? That x and q are mutually co prime. So, if x and q are mutually co prime, then I can apply my Fermat's little theorem. And what is that? x to the power of phi q, right? And phi q is q minus 1, because q is a prime number, right? And therefore, that should be equal to 1, right? And therefore, we apply this that is x to the power of phi q equal to 1 mod q and we get this as, so therefore, x to the power of phi q equal to 1 mod, mod q, I can raise it to the power of t, okay. So, t is any integer and that still remains 1, right. So, what about this that x to the power of uh, phi q, I mean t phi q, if I raise it to the power of phi p, that still remains 1 and you know that phi p into phi q is what? Phi n. So, that means x to the power of t phi n is congruent to 1 mod of q, right. So, that means I can write this x to the power of t phi n as 1 plus k into q where k is some positive integer value, right. So, multiplying both sides by x, so if I multiply both sides by x, then I get x to the power of t phi n plus 1 equal to x plus k q x, okay. So, now use, okay, this is since, okay, somehow this. Uh, software does this uh, thing. So, therefore, this since G C D of x comma p is equal to p, okay, because we have assumed that G C D of x comma q is equal to 1. So, G C D of x comma p is equal to p and therefore, x is actually a multiple of p, right. So, if you take this and if you substitute here, you get x plus k c p q. So, now if you take a mod of p q on both sides, you get back only x. So, you see that t of phi n plus 1 is nothing but a b and therefore, x to the power of a b is equal to x or congruent to x mod of n. Okay. Similarly, you can prove the other case also. Right. So, are we convinced about the proof? Right. Okay. So, therefore, the RSA holds whether x, whenever x belongs to z n in that case. Okay. So, we have proved that it holds when x belongs to z n star, we have also proved that it holds when x belongs to z n different z n star, right. So, it belongs to whenever x belongs to z n, okay. So, what we have proved is that if you take x, if you encrypt it and if you decrypt it by the corresponding inverse in z n star, okay, that is uh, when you are taking a mod of phi n, then actually what you obtain is the the plain text with which you started, right. So, what we have proved is the invertibility of the RSA transformation, right. That is the encryption and the decryption are inverses of one, uh, one another, okay. So, this is a simple example of p equal to 101 and q equal to 113. So, therefore, this is actually this is the RSA algorithm being shown, but actually this is not secured. Why? Because p and q are too small, okay. So, therefore, this is an insecure RSA example, okay. So, you can say that n, if I multiply it will be 11413 and phi n works to 100 into 112. So, just believe that it is correct right now. 
but you can see this because 101 and 100, uh, 112, so therefore it follows straight, right? So this you can actually factor, so therefore 2 power 6, 5 square and 7. So now B can be used for encryption if and only if, if it is a not a multiple of 2, 5 or 7, why? Yeah, because B has to have an inverse, multiplicity is inverse, no? and therefore B has to be mutually co-prime with phi n, right? So if B has to have, because AB is congruent to 1 mod phi n, no? so therefore B has to be mutually co-prime with phi n, right? So therefore B should not be divisible by 2, 5 or 7. So let B be equal to 1 value, say 3, 5, 3, 3. In practice, Bob will not factor phi n, but will check whether GCD of B comma phi n equal to 1 using the Euclidean algorithm. And you know that this is quite an efficient algorithm, right? It has got a polynomial runtime, and we'll compute the B inverse at the same time. Okay, so that's the way how we'll get the B inverse. So the Bob, what he does is that Bob publishes n equal to one one four one three because that's a product of the two prime numbers, and also the corresponding public key. Okay, so suppose Alice now wants to send some information, say x equal to nine seven two six to Bob. So what she does is that she computes x to the power of B mod n. So therefore, that's nine seven two six to the power of 3533, three, okay, which is the public key and does a mod of n, so mod of 11413 and what she computes is 5761 and sends it to Bob, okay. So now Bob needs to compute B inverse mod phi n, so she, uh, I mean he engages the Euclidean, extended Euclidean algorithm to, to do that and computes and finds out 6597 and then decrypts it using 5761 to the power of 6597. And believe me, it reduces to 9726. Okay, so therefore, uh, you get back whatever you started with. Okay, so that's a basic idea. Okay. So now the qu next question which comes to our mind in terms of implementation is that how do I compute this x to the power of c efficient, right? Because I need to compute the powers. So one good algorithm for doing that, I mean, one, th I mean, first in order to start, what we can do is that we can multiply x say c times. Okay. But you understand that that will actually not be very efficient, right? So what we can do is that we can express C in the binary format, okay? And then we can employ an algorithm which is the square and multiply algorithm, okay? So it's a quite a simple algorithm. So I will just uh, whatever I mean give a sketch of this. So seven, for example, suppose I need to compute x power seven, okay? So what do I do is that I take seven and I express seven in the binary format. Okay, so 1, 1, 1 is the corresponding binary format for 7. Okay. So what you do is that whenever you see a 1, okay, so each so the idea is like this that each time you, you start with x equal to 1. Okay. So each time whenever you see a, I mean whether you see a 1 or whether you see a 0, okay, so first of all you are parsing the digits here like this. So whenever you see a 0 or whether you see a 1, you are always doing a squaring operation. Okay. But if you see a 1, then you do a multiplication operation. Multiplication means multiplication with x, okay, right. So, right. So therefore, what you do is that you take x equal to one, and since you see here a one, so what you do is that you compute one square, right. So first of all, x will be equal to one square, which is one, okay. But since there is a one, therefore you will also multiply this with x, so you get x, okay. In the second stage, you see again a 1, so you do x equal to 1 square equal to, I mean rather x equal to x square because there is uh, x you square it and then you multiply the current x with x, so you get x to the power of 3. In the second case, you again see a 1, so what you do is that you take x and you square it, so it becomes x power 6 and then since it is a 1, you multiply this with x, so you get x power 7. Right. So you see that this will also work. I mean, let us take another example, say 5, 5 is equal to 1, 0, 1, and see how it works. Okay. So here again you start with x equal to 1, and since you get a 1, the first step will be again x equal to x. So I am just combining these two steps. Okay. In the second step, you see a 0, so you will do only the square part and not the multiplication part. Right. And in the third again you see a 1, so therefore you do what you do x power 4 and then you multiply this with x, so you get x power 5, right. So in this case, uh, you see that the maximum number of times you need to do, do this operation is actually the bit length of 
the corresponding exponent value. So, you can actually do it more efficient, right. So, what will be the runtime of this? If p is your maximum number of values there in the field, then it will be log p, right. So, therefore, it will be log p base 2. So, so therefore, this has got this is more an efficient algorithm, and there are ways how you can actually probably try to increase the efficiency, but this is the basic I, I mean, skeleton algorithm, okay. So, so, the next thing that we need to do is that we need to compute the parameters of RSA, okay. So, parameters of RSA means what? We have to choose the corresponding values, okay. So, therefore, uh, what we do is like this that you generate two large prime numbers p and q such that p is not equal to q, okay. So, and what is n? n is the product of p and q, right. And phi n is equal to p minus 1 into q minus 1, okay. So, now you have to choose a random b such that the GCD of b comma phi n has to be equal to 1, okay. And then compute the inverse of b mod phi n, okay. And then the public key is you publish is n comma b and the private key which you publish is p comma q comma a. From where? Given n and b. From n and b as a public key, can't you compute that a equal to b inverse mod phi n? Yeah, that you can't because of the phi n thing. Okay, so that's a nice question. Okay, so if you had not asked, then I would have asked in during the exams. Okay, so can you can you can, can you think of why it will not work? Because if I know the n, phi n is already known. Phi n is not known. Is phi n known? Because see, what you know is you know n equal to p. You know n equal to p q. Okay. So, what is phi n? Phi n is? Phi n is the number of prime number of numbers which are actually less than n and which are covariant to n. So, I can always find a kind of number of number of numbers. No, no, no. That is why that is why your size of n is 1024, okay. So, in that particular thing so there with so many values that approach will not work, okay. And computationally also you see that phi n equal to p minus 1 into q minus 1, correct. So, therefore, if you can find out phi n, then what does it mean? It means that you can write this phi n as p q minus p plus q plus 1, right. So, therefore, if you can compute phi n, that means what? That means that you can compute p plus q. If you can compute p plus q, you can also compute p minus q because you know p q, right. So, that means you can solve this and you can find p q. Right, so that means you can actually solve the factorization problem. Right, so but the thing is that it is assumed that factorization is quite a hard problem. I mean, 1024 bits is really hard problem. Okay, so therefore, I mean, okay, I mean, so therefore the idea is that uh, if you don't know the value of phi n, okay, from there computing the inverse of a is actually not so easy. Okay, so that's an again an assumption. There is no proof. Okay, so it is just a belief, okay. So, therefore, I have written here that it has been conjectured that breaking RSA is polynomial equivalent to factoring n, but there is no proof, okay, just a belief. So, typical value of n is generally 1024 bit long and the factors are also large of around 512 bits, okay. So, here you see that you have to do manipulation with so many bits. So, although you have got a good square and multiply algorithm to do that, but actually it is quite computationally intensive, okay. So, although it is efficient in terms of complexity theory, but in terms of practical implementation it is not really so efficient, okay. So, therefore, if I have a very handheld device and implant an RSA algorithm into that, my power will get extinguished very soon, okay. So, so therefore, you see that when you, you need proper replacements of these kind of asymmetric key algorithms, okay. And therefore, there are actually lot of work being done. For example, uh, of late the one of the current standards to use is something which is called elliptic curve crypto systems, okay. So, therefore, you can actually show that whatever security you get with say around 1024 bits, similar kind of security you can get with around say 192 bits of elliptic curves, okay. So, therefore, that is quite efficient. But no doubt, RSA is a one, one wonderful algorithm, okay. So, so, therefore, the next thing that we need to understand is that we need to understand that whether, so therefore, you see that the first step was to generate two large prime numbers p and q, 
right? So therefore, how do you understand if you have got a large number, say around 512 bits, you choose a number and you have to ascertain that whether that number is a prime number or not. So that's also a quite difficult problem, right? And you must have heard of the phenomenal work which has been done by Agarwal and Katyal and Saxena, right? The AKS algorithm, which actually shows that you can actually solve this problem in polynomial time, okay? So, but we, what we will discuss is about some probabilistic methods of doing, okay, some randomized algorithms through which we can actually approach this, approach this problem, okay. So, although that AK, the AKS problem is an undoubtedly a wonderful theoretical work, but the thing is that there are so many good probabilistic algorithms, okay, which has got a success probability very high, okay, and they are also very efficient. So, therefore, this problem practically essentially is quite a solvable problem, okay, although I cannot say for I mean, without the AKS algorithm, it was not understood that you can actually say it with certainty that it is a prime number, but actually you can using these algorithms, you can actually say that with a very high probability, right. So therefore, there lies the implication of this, I mean, why we need primality tests, okay. So therefore, given a num number, we have to ascertain that whether the number is a prime number or not, okay. So therefore, the question that we will address is that how do we say whether a given number is prime or not? But we will actually not do it in only one class, but we will go and break that into two classes, okay. So therefore, but the thing is that first we need to understand certain things like we will propose some randomized algorithms and these are called Monte Carlo algorithms. So what we have seen in the previous class was the La Vega algorithm, okay. And the difference between La Vega algorithms and Monte Carlo algorithms is this, that is in La Vega algorithms, what we saw was that it can fail, right, I mean that it cannot, it may, maybe that it will not terminate, right, but if it terminates, it will give you a correct answer, right. But in case of Monte Carlo algorithms, it will definitely terminate, okay. And there are two types of Monte Carlo algorithms, one which is called a yes best Monte Carlo algorithm and other which is called a no best Monte Carlo algorithm, okay. So, if it is a yes best Monte Carlo algorithm, then if it gives you a answer, yes, it is correct, it is definitely true. But if it says no, then there is an at most probability, like I mean there is an error probability in that. So, there, there is an estimate say epsilon which says the at most the error probability will be epsilon, okay. So, that means that if the answer is yes, it is correct in case of yes best Monte Carlo algorithms, but if, uh, if the answer is no, then you have to take it with a pinch of salt. Right. So then the idea is that the, the idea is that there it is not definitely trustworthy, but there is an error maximum upper bound of the error probability. Right. So therefore, these algorithms will give you an answer in time that is polynomial. I mean, so therefore, now come to this question that is we will engage some type of we will see some types of Monte Carlo algorithms to do this, and these algorithms actually give an answer in time which is polynomial in say log n base 2. So, which is the number of bits required to store n. However, there is a probability that the algorithm may claim that n is prime when it is not, okay. So therefore, it will say that some numbers are prime numbers when actually it is not a prime number and these numbers are called pseudo prime numbers, okay. So basically, uh, rather the problem that we will be addressing is actually whether it is composite or not, okay. So therefore, it will be like given a number, we have to say whether it is composite or not, okay. So you understand it is a decisional problem, right, yes or no but you do not, you are not solving the factorization problem, right. So therefore, even if we have this uh, polynomial time algorithm now like the AKS algorithm, RSA is not threatened because the RSA essentially believes or rather lies upon the assumption that you cannot factor, okay. So what we are only giving you is a primality test, but not a factorization algorithm, follow. So therefore, there is, there should not be any confusion regarding that, okay. So, so, we will just, uh, there is one theorem which is called the prime number theorem, which says that if the number of primes that are less than or equal to n can be estimated by this formula, okay. It says n by ln n, okay. So, if you take say n is of the order of 512 bits, then n will be around 2 to the power of 512, right. So, if you take pi n in that case or pi 2 to the power of 512, then it will work out to around uh, 200, uh, around 2 to the power of 512 divided by uh, divided by ln 2 to the power of 512, okay. So, there is a uh, problem here. So, it will be around 2 to the power of, okay. So, it will be around 2 to the power of 512 divided by 355, okay. So, what you can show is that 
so a random so if if you take a random 512 bit integer okay so it's okay so if you take a random 512 bit integer then it will be prime with a probability of around 1 by 355 okay so what it shows is that how many prime numbers do you have okay so it's around 2 to the power of 512 by 355 and how many numbers do you have 2 to the power of 512 so the probability that a randomly chosen number is actually a prime number is actually as high as 1 by 355 so which means if you repeat this we have seen now that if there is an experiment which is a probability of 1 by p if i repeat the experiment for p times then we are bound to get one success the expectation is that we will get one uh, one success and the probability of that is quite high right so therefore if i repeat this experiment for 355 times then there is a high probability that i will get at least one prime number okay so that number is not so large no? so i can do that and actually if you choose only odd in odd numbers then you can actually double your probability that is instead of randomly choosing numbers i only choose the the odd the odd integers okay so that will double my probability right yeah so that would, so therefore uh, yeah so therefore the probability of this is quite high and therefore what we will see is that the expected number of trials is not so uh, so, so large okay so therefore i can engage randomized algorithms to do that random algorithms which are just based upon some random decisions okay so now let's see what is a monte carlo algorithm so idea is that these are randomized algorithms which is which are generally yes based so which is yes based so therefore it means that there is always an answer when the answer is yes it is correct and if the answer is no then the answer may be wrong okay and if i say that the error probability of an yes based monte carlo algorithm is epsilon then I mean to say that for any instance if the answer is yes it can say no with the probability of at most epsilon okay so therefore for any instance if the answer is yes okay it can say no with the probability of at most epsilon so so therefore this probability is again as we have seen in case of Lavega algorithms also is over all the random choices of the algorithms that means if the algorithm receives some inputs then it is over the input space okay so the question that we will be addressing is this that is given a positive integer n greater than or equal to 2 is n composite so you understand that this is a decisional problem and we will try to discuss some al an algorithm which is called the solovay strassen algorithm to solve this and it's a monte carlo algorithm for composites okay therefore it says yes if it says yes then n is really composite right because the problem is composite now is it composite so if it says yes so first thing is it will definitely terminate second thing is that if it says yes right then it's correct but it can say no also right if it says no then the probability of error is at most half okay so in that case what i am saying is like this that is if it is composite there can be two cases right one is uh, yes and the other one is no right so if it's yes it's definitely composite okay but what I am saying is that the if the probability, if it, I mean, given that it is composite, right, the probability that it will say you are uh, no, okay, is actually, at, I mean, the probability of it's so this is an error, right? So therefore, it will, it, this will be at most half, okay. Yeah, so it will be at most half, okay. So it says probability of no given composite is at most half. Okay, so therefore it is less than equal to half. So that means that probability that if I say you are yes, given its composite is greater than equal to half. Right? So therefore that means that if the number n is composite, then it says yes with a probability of at least half. But to understand that again we need some more number theoretic results okay? and that is something which is called quadratic residues. So the idea of quadratic residues is quite nice and it is quite easy also to understand. So what is this that is suppose so let us see the definition. Okay? So definition is as follows that is uh, suppose p is an odd prime number so therefore p is an odd prime number means what exclude 2 right? and a is an integer then a is defined to be a quadratic residue modulo p if 
a is not congruent to 0 mod p and the congruence y square equal to a mod p okay so if i say y square equal to congruent to a mod p has a solution y which lies inside z okay so therefore the equation y square equal to a okay modulo p will have a solution for y which belongs to zp so therefore if i say you an if, say, if i say you that there is a quadratic residue and if i say you that a is a quadratic residue okay that means two things that means first it means that a is not congruent to 0 mod p okay so what does it mean no, a does not divide p right so a is co prime to p basically okay so therefore so a is uh, not congruent to 0 mod p and the other thing is that uh, i mean for if there is an equation of y square congruent to a mod p then there is a solution for y where y belongs to zp right so let's see one example so example would be like this say in z11 consider z11 and find out 1 2 3 4 and find out all the squares of that okay so that means that 1 square equal to 1 2 square equal to 4 3 square equal to 9 4 square equal to 5 so what does it mean that you see that all these values are essentially the quadratic residues because if i give you 5 then you can find out a 4 which is i mean if you raise it to the power of 2 you get obtain 5 okay so you see that this is a palindromic sequence you get a one year you get a one year you get a four year you get a four year why it's quite obvious why because you can actually write this uh, 10 as 11 minus 1 right and if you take modulo 11 whether you take a square all those 11 are i mean all the other terms are multiples of 11 right so therefore they vanish and you get back only minus 1 square which is 1 right so therefore in this fashion you can understand that you will always find a like i mean the the number of quadratic residues in this case will be exactly equal to 11 minus 1 by 2 because of this because you will always have an even number now one year one year four year four year so you can find out how many number of quadratic residues will be there so so if you generalize this then actually there are exactly p minus 1 by 2 quadratic residues right correct so if this is not the not the case that is a is defined to be a quadratic non residue modulo p if a is not congruent to 0 modulo p and a is not a quadratic residue modulo p so in this case what are not the quadratic residues see for example uh, 6 is a non quadratic residue right 2 is a non quadratic residue okay so how many non quadratic residues are there that's also same that's also 5 right right because we have excluded the a we have said at the beginning only a congru i mean a is not congruent to 0 mod p if you see the definition in both quadratic residues and non quadratic residues this a congruent to 0 mod p is excluded right. is it so anyone right how many numbers are there in z11 there are 11 numbers right okay so that's exactly same okay okay and so therefore how many solutions are there to this uh, question x square equal to a mod p okay so you can actually prove that i mean it's quite easy also you have understood more or less the idea that it will be exactly there are two solutions for the congruence okay so therefore if i give you one value here say if i give you one then how many values from from where we can get one you can get from one and you can also get from 10 okay so for every number a there can be two y's if you square you will get back a and the proof is exactly same as what we thought okay so it's quite simple only i mean if i go through the details then minus it says that if y square is congruent to a mod p then y belongs to z and y belongs to z p star then minus y whole square is also equal to a okay so therefore you can actually sh understand easily that y and minus y are both the solutions okay so y and minus 1 means in this case p minus y so one solution is y and the other one is p minus y if you square them you will get back a but why are there exactly two results because 
if you write like x square minus a equal to, you know, and congruent to 0 mod p, then you can factor that and it will become equal to x minus y into x plus y congruent to 0 modulo p and c is prime, p is prime, then p divides x minus p or p divides x plus y. So that means x is congruent to plus minus y mod p. So there are exactly two solutions which will satisfy this equation. So the proof is exactly intuitively what we understand. Okay. But what is the quadratic residue problem? So therefore, how do you understand that whether a number is quadratic residue? So quadratic residue, what you can do is that uh, the problem is this: that is an odd prime p and an integer a is given, and the question is, is a a quadratic residue modulo p? Okay. So what you can do is first of all you can raise and find out like what we have done for Z11, right? But can there be any better algorithm than that? So in order to solve that, again Euler comes to the rescue. Okay, and you have got this nice theorem. Okay, it says that let p be an odd prime number, then a is a quadratic residue modulo p p if and only if this is satisfied. That is, a to the power of p minus one by two is congruent to one modulo p. Okay, and the time complexity of this check is quite easy to understand. Is o log p whole cube because what you have to do is that you have to raise these powers, right? And raising power you know is o log p whole cube. Why? Because if you just think of the square and multiply algorithm. You will understand why it's O log P whole cube. Okay, so so can you can you can you justify why it's true? So you see that there are two parts, if and only if. Okay, so let us do start one by one. I mean it's quite easy the proof. So the case one will be like uh, if you say that A is a quadratic residue modulo P. Okay. So that means what? That is, there is a solution y if you raise to the power of a. Okay, so y lies inside zp. So there has to exist such a y. Okay. Now what about the equation a to the power of p minus one by two in, in that case? It is y to the power of two whole to the power of p minus one by two. So what is that equal to? Y to the power of p minus one mod p. And what is that? Yeah, so what is that equal to? Equal to 1. Equal to 1. That is the Fermat's little theorem, right? So y to the power of p minus 1 mod p is equal to 1. So therefore, this proves the only if part. Okay. What about the other part? You start with this, that is a to the power of p minus 1 by 2 is equal to 1 mod p. Okay. And by my uh, previous days, if you remember that cyclic group uh, idea, then actually I can, if there is an element say B, which is a primitive element in this group, there has to exist one primitive element, right. So if I say that B is the primitive element, then I can always write A as B to the power of some i value, right. And you know what is the range of i, so it has to lie inside that cyclic group. Okay. So therefore, in that case, if you plug in B to the power of i here, you get b to the power of i into p minus 1 by 2 is congruent to 1 mod p. Okay? But you know that, but we know that b to the power of p minus 1 is equal to 1 mod p. Okay? And p minus 1 is the minimum, is the least number which is like that. Because why? Because b is a primitive element. Right? It is the least number for which this equation is obtained. Okay? So that means that p minus 1 has to divide i into p minus 1 by 2 because p minus 1 by i into p minus 1 by 2 has to be a bigger number right so if i p minus 1 divides i into p minus 1 by 2 it means that i is divided by 2 that is i is an even number so this implies that i is even so if i is even then you see that from this equation you can obtain a square root of this a and therefore, you can say that plus minus b to the power of i by 2 is a square root of of a. Okay? And that proves that a is a quadratic residue. Right? So, we stop at this point and we will continue, we will see that how we can use this to understand the primary details, I mean 
yeah, to understand the primary test and other certain other issues. So, so we will again follow that up with the factorization problem also. So we stop at this point. <coughs> <coughs>